Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Hyperfine Swoop Portable MR Imaging Demonstration. We'll get started in about 30 seconds as people are gathering. Thank you. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. My name is Chris Ward. I'm part of the leadership team here at Hyperfine. Welcome to our product demonstration. We greatly appreciate you taking time out of your, your day in life to be with us. Today, what we will do is we will share a few slides with you talking about our portable MR imaging system. Second, we will show you the device in action, uh, wheeling down our hallway into our simulated ICU here in Connecticut, about two hours outside of New York City. Then we will show you uh, images, clinical images with pathology, and then we'll take questions and answers. And a, a point on that, questions and answers throughout, please. We will attempt to answer those as we go using the, uh, the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your window in Zoom. Use that to enter questions. We will get to them as we can. At the end, we should have time to field all of your questions. Those that we do not get to, we'll apologize for now, but we will follow up with you in a separate email. So again, thank you for being with us. Next slide, please. Hyperfine was founded in 2014 by a man I'm very lucky to know, Dr. Jonathan Rothberg. And Jonathan is a serial entrepreneur, a scientist if ever there was one, and a humanitarian. The companies that he has founded all share a common theme about doing right, about expanding access to care, and using scientific innovation and economic accessibility to achieve those goals. Uh, to know Hyperfine is also to know Butterfly Network in the point of care ultrasound space. So this is that black device you may have seen with a butterfly logo, butterfly uh, IQ plus is the product, plugs into an iPhone, sells for about 2000 US dollars, which is an incredible price in that space. We'll talk about Hyperfine, but if you know Butterfly, you know Hyperfine, you know something about the other. And you see an omission here, an incredible statement about driving access to imaging. In fact, where we stand today in MR adoption, only 10% of the world has access to MR today. And even in the country in which I stand today, the United States, we would still say that we, we suffer from access problems. It's in the basement. It requires a physicist or two to operate. There's a lot of reasons why MR is not as present in the clinical environment as it could be until now. Next slide. So I'm gonna ask you to think about your childhood and think about the photographs. Think about the time the camera came out. Your parents took the camera out and took photos on certain occasions. And I want you to fast forward to today and think about photography today in your, in your current life, in your consumer life, in your home life, in your personal life. Think about that. The question really is, what makes you a better photographer today than your parents were decades ago at the same stage in life? So I'm gonna to turn to one of my guests, uh, Sam Bai, PhD, one of our clinical scientists who will dem help me demonstrate the device later on. And I'll ask Sam, Sam, what makes you a better photographer than your parents were, if that's the case? Uh, I'm not a better photographer than my oh, parents. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah? We all, we all use the same camera. We're all for, we all just use our iPhone. Got it. iPhone, folks, the iPhone. So today we, have, we all have cameras in our pockets and the occasion for photography comes up on a daily basis. And because of that, we tend to be better photographers. Um, I ask you to think about the idea of MR being more present in the clinical environment than it's ever been in its 40 year history. And what does that mean for the practice of medicine for informed decision-making? Uh, click the slide, please, and we'll see a little fun image of a, an image you can't get with anything but an iPhone. You can't shoot an SLR through a chain link fence. Next slide. So our device um, in, a, in a single shot, in a single photograph, there it is. What you're looking at working from the bottom to the top, my favorite part at the bottom, the wheels. 
So MR imaging on wheels, drive wheels underneath. There is a joystick on the device. You'll see that. The caster is on the outside perimeter for stability. Just above that, onboard workstation. And above that, kind of the working end of our device, which would be the eight channel head coil surrounded by an aluminum cage to control for RF energy or electromagnetic interference in the environment. We'll talk about the uh, neon yellow thing at the top in a moment. Two things missing from this photograph. One actually peeks out from the backside, which is the power cord. We plug into a standard wall outlet and use less than 900 watts of power at, at peak, uh, peak performance. And that's less than a coffee pot. An electric coffee pot is the amount of power we use, meaning we can go anywhere. Second thing missing in the photograph is something we all, uh, we all know and very familiar with is an iPad. The device ships with an iPad, and indeed, that is our interface for setting up our exam, for entering basic, uh, basic patient information, and for reviewing images at bedside. Uh, it's an iPad. Next slide. An image here that uh, we at Hyperfine and, and our audiences love. The idea that MR could be used in this environment here with a parent, a loved one, not just close by during the exam, in physical contact. Um, the sounds of our system, which you'll hear today, are such that no earplugs are required. So mom, in this case, can be talking to her three-year-old son during the exam. Just a little while longer, just a little while longer, we're going to get this done. Pretty touching image. And if you have a really astute eye, you'll notice on mom's left wrist, you'll notice wedding jewelry, you'll notice a Fitbit as well. We'll talk about our, uh, our performance in uh, metal content environments, ferromagnetic equipment in a short bit. Next slide. Our workflow in a single image. So again, we're bringing MR to the bedside. When we founded our company in 2014, there were really two goals. One is exactly what we just said, is to go bedside with MRI. The second thing is to make it economically accessible. And if you did those two things, you would drive access. You would drive ubiquity. So here in one image, you see a workflow. You'll notice here, and this is uh, Dr. Sam Bai here, her left hand on the joystick, driving it to the head of the bed. You'll see how tall this device is, but it's about five feet tall, about three feet wide. That's how to think about that. Go right to the head of the bed. We're going to lower the bridge to span the gap between our head coil and the bed, and then load the patient. Next slide. I mentioned the top, the neon yellow ring, our Gauss guard. Our five Gauss line, for those of you who are familiar with MR, is 62 inches across, about five feet across. So we just deploy that when we're going down a hospital corridor where there may be carts and there may be beds and other you know, metal items in the environment, or patients with pacing equipment or you know, cardiac implants, just remind them it's a magnet. Please stay back. But we'll show you our field strength in just a moment. Next slide. If we were together in person, we'd kind of, you know, put our hands on these items here, but courtesy of Zoom, we'll kind of zoom in, yeah, as it were, on each of these elements of the device. And you can see casters, our control panel. For the first time, you see our iPad, the working environment for our iPad that close to the magnet. And then on the right side, look at the image, how clean and clear that is, all those surfaces. And in a world where we are incredibly focused around infection control, you can think about how quick it is to wipe out that eight channel head coil or the magnetic plates both above and below the patient's head. Next slide. And summing it up, when people see our system, when they go hands-on and they look at it and they go, wow, what does this enable? And you start to think about through these photographs, the places where you can now bring MR imaging into patient rooms, into ICUs, a lot of things become enabled that we couldn't think of as possible for MR before. Next slide. Also zooming in here a little bit, we talked about controlling for metal and uh, electromagnetic interference in the environment. And when you look here, and this is a patient room converted into an ICU at the height of the COVID crisis in New York City or just outside of New York City. So this would have been the spring really of last year in the April timeframe. And you really see, you know, drips and a ventilated, you know, patient in here and you see HVAC equipment and all of that surrounding the environment. 
and nonetheless, we're able to go in there with Swoop and generate a clear diagnostic image. Whereas before, getting an image for that patient, an infectious patient, involved a lot of prep time, patient transport time, cylindrical fixed MR to get that disinfected between patients. There's a lot involved. Much simpler, much better to go straight to the patient room, image at bedside, wipe out the device and its surfaces, and move to the next patient. Next slide. And here, I mean, I think everybody in provider land, everybody at a hospital knows the day they're getting a new MR system. Uh, you know it because whether it's the jackhammers or the cement truck or the construction workers, a lot's involved with changing out, replacing a magnet or installing an incremental MR system. We know what that looks like. Our delivery in as little as seven days in the United States, we show up, we go to your loading dock or we go right in the front door of your institution, we wheel it in, we go on a standard patient elevator, we bring it in and we're usually installing a system, installing in three to four hours. Now, one thing for, for evidence, uh, a lot of our audience cares quite a lot and for very good reason about clinical evidence. Uh, this comes courtesy of a large team uh, with the principal author, Dr. Kevin Sheff at Yale. Um, you'll, you'll be able to read this paper in JAMA Neurology. Very, very popular paper, one of the highest read last year in all of JAMA Neurology, but we'll lay out our performance of our images in a neuro uh, ICU relative to uh, contrast enhanced CT. So look for that article, I think you'll enjoy it. We've been blessed with a lot of interest, uh, blessed with a lot of great customers and research partners. And here you get a little sense of that. Um, it is an event, uh, despite what I said earlier, when Swoop is deployed into a system, most people know about it. Wow, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Is that even possible? We're about to show that to you today. What to look for in this demo? You'll see the iPad. That's our primary interface for choosing the sequences, entering basic patient information, image review, and you're gonna see the images appear as the data is acquired. We don't wait to complete the whole exam and then pop the image on screen. Once we get 10% of our data acquired, we're gonna show you that image on screen. We push it to iPhone and then we, we ship with our own uh, cloud-based packs or we integrate via DICOM to incumbent pack systems. Next slide. Okay, with that, that's the end of our slides. We're gonna to go to our demo here. At the conclusion of our demo, we'll hear from Dr. Eddie Knopp. Um, Eddie Knopp joined the company this year, um, long-standing uh, neuroradiologist, principal background at New York University or NYU, given over 200 uh, lectures, invited lectures, around the world in the subject of radiology and neuroradiology. So Eddie will share with us a point of view on some of our clinical images with pathology. So let's get into our demo. Pardon me while I go uh, man the system, we'll drive it into the room. Um, for those of you who are looking at home, you can just look at the swoop. Um, oh, I'm going to spotlight it now. So you can look at the swoop uh, window and you'll be able to see Chris bring in the scanner in the hallways. You can see the gas guard is fully uh, deployed. So it's about two and a half feet from the center of the magnet. Uh, Chris has one hand on the handle and one hand on the joystick. Now he's bringing the bridge down so you can take a closer look at the head coil. Um, he's going to show you how low field strength the magnet really is. He has a keychain in his hand and you can kind of see the pull of the magnet. Just like that. So really the concern with projectiles is non-existent. Now he's going to continue 
to drive the device to the bedside where we have our patient volunteer for today. So it's right behind the bed. He's carefully maneuvering the system to bring the bridge down. It's really just that simple. Gonna, you can see the uh, power cord in his hand and then he'll turn off the joystick and plug the coil, the cable into the wall. And now he's plugging an ethernet connection uh, for more secure Wi-Fi network connectivity. We do support Wi-Fi configurations as well. Um, this is just for a more stable connection on the system right now for the demo. The last thing we're gonna do is just put this uh, back half on the, the system just to make it a little bit more comfortable for the patient. It's gonna slide on top of this bridge, which bridges the gap between the patient bed and the device. Um, and then just momentarily, we will slide the patient into the system for the demo. You may have noticed that I opened the RF screen uh, while I'm loading the patient, um, but I'll make sure to close that before we actually scan. And we're gonna count on three to slide the patient. So one, two, three. One, two, three. And then I'm just gonna stick a couple of pads here on, beside his ear just to make sure he doesn't move during the scan. Now I will close the RF screen to prevent any other interference from coming into the room. And let me go ahead and share my screen over here so that you can see the user interface. All right, so normally I would be running this scan from an iPad, just a, a normal iPad, uh, but just to show you the actual screen and what's going on, I'm running it off of my laptop um, and you can see, follow through exactly what's going on. So I'm going to log in with some credentials. And this is the user interface page that everybody would uh, typically see. So you can go to your patient tab and you can enter patient information uh, such as the patient ID, the full name, the date of birth, the sex. You can also connect to a modality work list uh, as you see here. Refresh the list and I'm just we've just simulated a few different patient uh, informations and then we're just going to register the patient. Um, so it shows you here. One unique feature is that we can enter email addresses so you'd be notified of the uh, scan once the scan is complete. So I've entered my email there. Then you can go to the exam tab and you can select from a list of predefined protocols or you can make your own protocol by selecting from this list of sequences. Uh, so today I'm gonna run a um, T2 scan right here. And I'm going to, I dragged it over. I'm going to delete this localizer and then I'm going to go ahead and press play. So while you're scanning, you can add additional sequences if you'd like. Uh, we have the typical flare T1, T2, and diffusion in different uh, planes. Um, you can add things while you're scanning and then we'll just add sequentially to the playlist. Um, but you can also delete the exa this exams like that, and you can move things around by just selecting from the arrows. Um, so this is about a seven minute exam. Uh, you can see the progress at the top uh, showing here. And as we get enough data, we'll start seeing a real time live update uh, on, this, on this page here. So we'll start seeing a montage of 
images uh, pop up and the images will just get better and better as we keep scanning along. So as the data, as we get more data, it'll just uh, use that data to reconstruct the image. I've seen a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, somebody asked whether the head coil could be removed and yes, it could can be removed. You simply just unplug the connector and there's wings on the bottom of the coil and they just slide around this mushroom at the magnet. So uh, you can clean beneath it um, as the question asked um, and it's very easy to remove this coil to do so. Another question asked about um, where's the image processing done and everything is done on the system itself. Uh, you'll get, you'll see the images reconstruct on the computer. The host computer is in the white pill box below here. So this is where all the electronics are and that's where everything is performed. Uh, we do have new FDA clearances for AI apps um, where you can get different segmentations. Uh, so that is done on the cloud. So you can see the images uh, coming up right now. Uh, to 3D volume, uh, 3D acquisition, and you're looking at axial slices from the top to the bottom of the brain. Uh, and so does the patient need hearing protection? Uh, the answer is no, they do not. Uh, you can see that the patient didn't put any earplugs before going into the scan. Uh, he's, all he has is the pads on the side of his ears right now to make him a little bit more comfortable to prevent motion. Uh, somebody asked if there was a pulse sequence list uh, with some parameters used for imaging. We can definitely share those. Uh, just briefly, we have the four sequences, T1, T2, flare, and diffusion. The T1 is, uh, T1 and T2 are about 1.5 by 1.5 by 5 millimeters uh, resolution. Um, and the diffusion is slightly larger and the flare is 1.6 by 1.6 by 5. Uh, if you ran all four of those exams, it would take about 25 minutes to run the full protocol. Uh, somebody else asked if we have different sizes of the head coil. No, we do not. Uh, we only have this one head coil uh, for now. So if I'm not mistaken, that head coil in development was designed to accommodate what percentage of the population? Uh, good question. It was 95% of the population. Okay. So uh, we've seen that the head coil is uh, from uh, accommodating for patients. We even scan patients that were intubated, and usually the tube will just come on and hit the top of the magnet, but uh, we scan ventilated patients. And what types of patients um, are not recommended for smooth portable MR? So the question was what type of patients are not recommended for swoop MRI? And right now, our contraindications are really active devices, so devices like a pacemaker. Uh, and right now we're deferring to labeling. So if it says that it's MRI conditional and it can scan something at 1.5 or below, then it's fine, but it really has to state our frequency to make sure that it doesn't uh, uh, inflict any unwanted effects. Uh, passive metal is not too big of a concern because of our wavelengths at this frequency. Can you tell us a little bit more about the deployment process? So uh, Swoop is delivered to a clinic or a health system. What's involved to get it up and running? So the question was uh, the deployment process and what that kind of looks like. Uh, so for the deployment, uh, one of us on the clinical science or clinical applications team is there to support deployment. We meet our white glove delivery service to wheel the system from the loading dock to your area for storage. Uh, once we're at the storage area, we connect the device to the network, and then we also connect to the PACS and uh, if you have a local PACS network or to the Hyperfine cloud. Once the system is completely configured to the settings that you prefer, uh, we will run some test scans uh, just to make sure 
everything looks good. And then we will start with training, which only lasts about an hour to an hour and a half. And the safety usually, the training usually consists of safety slides, um, as well as how to drive the system and how to run the, run the system. In a somewhat related question, tell us about the uh, service requirements for the system by which uh, I think the question refers to maintenance. There, uh, there is a site QA phantom that comes with the device. Uh, we recommend running a site QA check every month uh, just to make sure the system is performing uh, as it was intended to perform. Uh, and then most all of our uh, electronics are very modular so they they're on boards that are easy to replace um so and these have not had we haven't had too much trouble with any of these components thank you so we have about 30 more seconds left in this image acquisition you can see that the images are getting bigger and better already you can auto um window and level to take a look at that And um, when it's when the final image is being reconstructed, I'll pass it off to Eddie, who will be able to show you guys um, some clinical examples. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen while it finishes this last few seconds, and then I'll pass it along to you, Eddie. Okay, thanks, Sam. So I'm going to share my screen and show you some clinical examples of cases. What I want to emphasize is that this device is not a device that's going to replace your 3T, your 1.5, and clearly a 7T for those who have it, but rather it's a device that will answer a specific clinical question in a situation where you wouldn't otherwise be able to get that question answered. You know, I think one of the benefits to use that term of COVID was the ability to prove the utility of this case, of this system in scenarios where patients didn't want, where the in, institutions didn't want to move the patients and subject themselves or the patients to additional risk. So this first patient, this first case is that of an intubated ICU patient with a concern for an acute stroke. So here we have axial, let me go slower. T2 weighted images demonstrating signal abnormality within the distribution of the left middle cerebral artery. We can look at the diffusion weighted image and see corresponding diffusion weighted abnormality and the ADC. So the diffusion images will give you the output of a B0, a B800, and the ADC map. We can see on the ADC map there's restricted diffusion as well. And based on these images in this unstable intubated ICU patient, the decision was made that this was a most likely a large vessel occlusion, patient was taken to the angio suite and mechanical thrombectomy was performed. So let's take a look at another case. And this is a case, again, this is a COVID patient on a COVID unit with new cerebellar dysfunction. And we can see on the flare image, signal abnormality, within the posterior fossa, the distribution of the superior cerebellar arteries and the superior aspect of the cerebellum. You can clearly see mass effect on the fourth ventricle. On the T2, same thing, mass effect on the fourth ventricle and the signal change. The diffusion weighted image shows that this is an acute infarct with corresponding restriction in apparent diffusion coefficient. Based upon this, the diagnosis of infarct was obviously made. However, given the size of the infarct and the location, a decision was made not to fully anticoagulate or use TPA for risk of increasing the mass effect and causing resultant obstructive hydrocephalus. The patient was placed on antiplatelet agents and the patient did fairly well once they recovered from their COVID. And the last case that I'm gonna show you just got to find the thing. This is something's in the way here. It is this patient. Which is a very interesting patient. This is an intubated COVID patient, unstable with a known large, and you can see that, left middle cerebral artery, almost internal carotid artery, territory distribution. The question was, is this a chronic infarct 
or is this patient continuing to infarct? Clearly, we know in the setting of COVID, there's a lot of hypercoagulable states and these patients get infarct. The diffusion image, as we see here, the ADC portion of the diffusion image, as we see here, shows that in addition to the more chronic areas as seen on the diffusion there, there is active infarct as well. So this patient is having progressive ischemia with more mass effect. Based upon this and discussion with the patient's family, a decision was made to stop life support and the patient subsequently expired. So you can see here the clinical use cases. You're gonna use this system, not as a replacement, but rather as a tool to answer specific clinical questions in situations where you wouldn't otherwise obtain an MR. So let me stop sharing and go back to Sam. Thank you, Eddie. Um, so the patient scan has completed. I will share the final images here. So you should be able to see the final reconstructed images here. The exam was complete. Uh, one question is that we noticed that it took a couple of minutes to do the post-processing. Uh, if we did have another scan queued up, it would automatically run, start running that sequence. So you wouldn't have to wait for the scan to completely process to start the next one. We do have concurrent uh, recon. So this is complete. And then you would press the check mark and then the images would be sent to your local PACS or your Hyperfine Cloud um, to, to be done with. So now I'm gonna pass it back to Chris, uh, who will wrap up. Great, again, thanks for being here. I hope you've enjoyed the demo. I know there were a few questions which related to uh, our, our price point or our, our commercial model, or how would you, how would you purchase the system? Um, first, hyperfine.io is our URL, I encourage you to visit. You will find some exams and other information there, but you'll also find our pricing. So our, our pricing is public and is out there. It's available on our website. Um, soon enough, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to expand more information in there about delivery dates and other things. Soon you'll be able to choose a delivery date online for Hyperfine Swoop Portable MR, and we will arrange to, to ship it to you and deliver it to you on that date. Uh, for pricing, we look at it as, as we have simplified MR imaging, let's also simplify the procurement, the, the purchase of that. So what we do is very simple. Our pricing is five to 7,000 US dollars per month, depending on whether you wanna uh, purchase or lease the system, or you want it for three or five years. Those are sort of the main variables. So five to $7,000 a month brings you portable MR imaging. Typically, that is less than what you're paying for for the service contract for an existing 1.5 Tesla or a CT, a multi-slice CT scanner, those kinds of things. So keeping it very simple in service to our mission of driving increased access to MR through economic affordability and simplicity. You saw it here with an iPad with, I don't want to say a single button, this isn't quite Amazon one-click ordering, but it approaches that. Let's simplify, let's drive access and deliver on, on a mission of enhanced uh, access to MR imaging. Sam, before we, uh, we sign off, um, other questions? If you have questions now, please enter them in the Q&A window down at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we're happy to hang out and answer your questions. Yeah, so uh, someone asked about uh, the qualifications required for the operator. Uh, so as you can see, the scanner itself is very easy to use. Uh, our use base right now is really expands from uh, research assistants to nurses to residents and fellows, to doctors, to radiology technologists. Uh, you, we don't expect an MR technologist to be required to run our device. Uh, in some states for billing, they do require some sort of technologist, um, but that's a state-by-state -state, uh, credential. Okay. Yes, if, uh... Chris, uh, do you want to talk about our install phase right now? Uh, how many scanners are out on the field? Sure. So we're available uh, for sale. Our FDA clearance uh, and regulatory clearance is in the United States market only. We are uh, pursuing as quickly as we can entry into additional countries, and we expect to do that in one fell swoop. Pardon the pun, but we expect to be able to expand to multiple countries um, in the near future. Um, in the United States, between research and other sites, we have uh, something approaching uh, 40 units right now, and that's expanding rapidly. So 
sales increase are high. Um, a lot of belief in this particular product. We're, uh, we're blessed to enjoy that, that kind of demand. But that notwithstanding, we remain able to deliver a system to you within seven days. Great, thanks, Chris. And uh, can you answer when do you plan on finishing CD certification? Or what our thoughts are on that? Uh, we're in the middle of that process, so I don't have a, a quote available for that, but we are, we are uh, engaged in that process now. Great. Uh, there was also another question about whether or not we operate outside of the US, for example, in Africa. Uh, we are not commercially available to serve these areas, but uh, under research agreements, we are able to. We actually just shipped our first unit to Malawi a couple weeks ago, and I believe it touched base just a few days ago. Oh, fantastic. I knew it shipped out. That's fantastic. Great. Have, uh, do you want, there's a couple of questions about uh, the acquisition time, and I didn't know if you wanted to kind of give your perspective from a clinical radiologist about the acquisition time, if there were any concerns about a them being too long. Sure, Sam. Uh, I actually had answered one of those questions. And as I had stated, the purpose is to answer specific clinical questions. So let's say our specific question is, does the patient have a stroke? Is their brain at risk? Is there a diffusion abnormality? Once you run the diffusion sequence and do that first, if that's positive, the neurointerventionalist or whomever can then take the patient to their angio suite and treat the patient accordingly. Likewise, if it's a post-operative patient in the ICU who all of a sudden decompensates in the middle of the night, the question is, did they bleed or did they have a stroke? Run the diffusion sequence. If that's negative, run a flare. If you see intracranial hemorrhage, you know there's hemorrhage in the, in the brain maybe in the surgical site, take them to the OR. So you don't necessarily need to run the entire gamut of all sequences for a 30 minute study. Once your question's answered, you're done. Great, thank you so much. And then there was just one clarification wanting on the subscription. Mm -hmm. Does the five to seven K include service and parts? It does, so great question, thanks for it. Um, we include everything, I should have, should have laid that out for you. It's everything. So we we don't believe in uh, nickels and dimes, as they say in the United States, or uh, add-on pricing. So that that number includes everything. It includes the the depending if you own or you lease, but the system, the head coil. It includes all clinical training. It includes delivery. It includes uh, software, the cloud packs, or the connectivity to your own packs. And then we don't sign a separate service contract with you at an over and above charge. It's all included. Um, we believe the system is very, very simple. It uh, doesn't require extensive service or preventive maintenance or PM as they call it. But nonetheless, um, if something happens, we send our field engineer out. We get you back up and running as quick as we possibly can. All one number. Keep it simple. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and I guess I will wrap up with uh, someone asked how they can contact us. Sure. So um, hyperfine.io is our URL. We also have an 866 number that you'll find if you advance one slide. I think you'll actually see this information. Um, yeah, there we go. I think. Yep, perfect. There we go. So you can reach us at either. We'd love to hear from you. Give us your thoughts, your impressions. We're happy to do a one-on-one a -on -one demo with you and your colleagues and your institution at any time. Uh, it's kind of fun to see the system and get a little bit deeper with it. We'd be, we'd be honored. Thank you. So with that, if there are no further questions, you have our thanks, of course, for your time and your interest in Hyperfine Swoop Portal MR Imaging. Please be in touch with us as we go forward and uh, we'd love to chat. Thanks very much.